This is the video lecture on income tax withholding. Now in an earlier video we talked about the various pieces of legislation that affect the payroll profession. Then we talked about how to calculate gross pay and then we started talking about the various deductions. And in the very last lecture we were talking about social security deductions. Well now we need to talk about income tax withholding. In order to calculate the income taxes that are to be withheld, first we need to know what are the actual taxable wages. And the taxable wages, that will be our basis for the calculation. So many things have to be included in the taxable wages. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not so obvious. So first of all, wages and salaries, clearly that will be included in taxable wages. Most people wouldn't question that but also vacation pay. Vacation pay is a substitute for regular wages, so that also is taxable. Any forms of supplemental pay, bonuses and commissions are clearly a form of compensation. Certain fringe benefits, and we're gonna talk about fringe benefits in more detail in a moment, tips and also cash awards. So potentially all of these items might have to be added in and included in the taxable wages so that we would have the proper basis to then calculate the amount of income tax to be withheld. Now talking about fringe benefits, some of the fringe benefits are going to be taxable, some are going to be non-taxable. So any of these benefits that are taxable those would have to be added in to the tax base, whereas the ones that are non-taxable will be excluded from the tax base. So if we provide our employee with a vehicle, that's taxable. If we give them a free or a discounted flight, that's taxable. Any type of discount on a property or a service, paid vacations, paid memberships, complimentary tickets, all of these are considered fringe benefits and they are all to be taxable. They are all to be added to the tax basis. But then we have non-taxable benefits. So things like no cost services. For example, if we own a hotel and we allow our employee to spend the night in the hotel and the room was empty, well, it doesn't cost us anything. The room wasn't rented out anyway. That's a no-cost benefit to the employee. So that's not taxable. If we give our own employees a discount on our own products, that's not taxable. If we give them certain working condition benefits, transportation from place to place, now that's different than simply providing them with a car. In this case, we're just giving them a transportation service. Any kind of on-premise facilities. We might have a exercise facility, swimming facilities, recreational facilities. That's just provided to our employee as a benefit. And even though it has a value, it's not taxable. Reduced tuition program. A lot of businesses do that. Or job placement. So all of these are just additional fringe benefits. And a lot of businesses offer these in order to reward their employees and also to recruit employees. You know, businesses want to be competitive and attract the best possible people. And so a lot of times they'll do that by offering all kinds of great benefits. But these particular benefits are actually non-taxable. Now another item that we need to discuss is retirement. There are certain retirement plans that some employees will participate in, and if that's the case, it does have an effect on our calculations. Because in some cases, we will actually deduct the contributions that were made to the retirement. So some of these contributions are going to be non-taxable. So the first example is a 401k plan. A lot of businesses offer this to their employees. And this is a plan where the employee will contribute a certain percentage of their salary. And when they contribute that money, it's going to go into a retirement plan. 
and sometimes the employer will match the contribution. But this is tax-free. Same thing with 403B. Same thing with 457. All three of these, the contributions are tax-free. So that needs to be deducted from the employee's uh, tax basis. And then sometimes employees will contribute to an individual retirement account. That is also deducted. Really the only one that's not deducted would be any Roth IRA contributions. Because in a Roth IRA, the money is actually taxed at the beginning rather than at the end. But many of these options are very popular among the employees, and if they participate in that, it certainly affects their tax basis. Now the next item we need to take a look at is the personal allowance. Everyone is given a personal allowance by the IRS, and the intention is this covers personal expenses. So this is going to be deducted from everyone's pay before we calculate the taxes. Currently, personal allowance is $3,650. That amount does change somewhat from year to year. So we always have to keep up with that to make sure we're using the proper amount for the personal allowance. Then we're going to have withholding allowances. Now withholding allowances are actually claimed by the employee. And in order to know how many withholding allowances the employee is claiming, they're going to fill out a W-4 form. Now when they fill out this form, how many allowances are they entitled to? Well, they are entitled to one for themselves. They're entitled to one for their spouse if they are legally married. And they're also entitled to one for every dependent. Now, when you fill out that W-4, you can claim as many withholding allowances as you are entitled to or less. Some people might be entitled to many allowances and they don't necessarily claim those allowances. And why is that? Well, to understand that, we have to understand the strategy behind withholdings. The more allowances that we claim, the less money is going to be withheld for taxes. Whereas the fewer allowances that we claim, the more is going to be withheld from our taxes. So that is why we have a strategy there. Now what do you want? It depends. Some people would like to claim as many allowances as possible so that way less money is withheld and they make more money every payday. The downside to that though is that at the end of the year when they do their taxes, chances are they're probably going to have to pay on their taxes. Whereas other people prefer to claim less allowances so that way more money is withheld for taxes. They're going to draw less money at every pay period, but the good news is when they file their taxes, they will most likely get a refund. So it really just depends on what the person's goals are and what their strategy is. But that is the strategy behind claiming the allowances. And like I said, you're allowed to claim what you're entitled to or fewer all the way down even to zero. In fact, most people claim zero. Now, once we know the person's tax basis, once we know their status, once we know their withholdings, then we can actually begin to calculate the tax. And when we calculate that tax, we actually have two different methods. And eventually, when we do our demo problem, for this lesson, we're going to see exactly how to calculate each one. But in this lecture, we're going to talk about the pros and cons. We could go with potentially the percentage method or possibly the wage bracket method. Now, if we decide to use the percentage method, what are the ups and downs? Well, with percentage method, it does require more calculations. So we do have to do a lot of calculations mathematically in order to get the answer. So that is a downside. But on the upside, it's going to be more detailed and more accurate. And also, we're not going to have to have as many tables. 
And also, we could use this method for any level of income. It doesn't matter how much money the person has made. Now, if you contrast that with the wage bracket method, this method is a little different. On the upside, it has a, a lot less calculations. In fact, there are almost no calculations. You literally just look at tables and find the right information and look up a certain number. But as a result, it is also less accurate and it can only be used up to a certain income level. So if the person makes too much money, they would go off the chart, so to speak, and we would actually not be able to use this method and we would have to revert to the percentage method. And it requires very lengthy tables. There are very long, lengthy, multiple tables that you have to go through. So if you look at both methods, they both have their ups and downs, but ultimately we are going to learn to do both because you never know which method a particular company is going to use. Now once we've calculated and withheld the income tax, what are some other responsibilities that we have as payroll professionals? We actually have a couple more responsibilities, and one of those is called a W-2. Now the W-2 form is an official IRS form and it keeps a record of all wages that have been received by every employee. So all year long we will keep an internal running total year to date of all money that all of our employees have received. And at the end of the year we will then prepare those W-2 forms. Now, when do these W-2 forms get prepared? The thing is, we can't work on these forms until after the year is over. It's for a calendar year. So it's not until January 1st that the year is finally over and you actually have all the information that you need to be able to prepare these forms. And then when you start on them, what is the deadline? Well, they must be completed and postmarked by January 31st. So essentially, we have one month to prepare all the W-2s for all of our employees. So that's why the month of January typically is one of the busiest months for a payroll professional. And when we do complete these W-2s, we have different copies. We're going to keep a copy, but we're also going to mail two copies out. One is going to be mailed to the IRS, the other is mailed out to the employee. Now why do we do it that way? Well that way the employee receives a copy, they use it to do their taxes, to file their taxes, but the IRS always has a copy that they can compare it to. So that's the point behind that. And then our other responsibility are the 1099 forms. We also have to do these every year. And the 1099 forms, that keeps track of all payments that were made to non-employees. So sometimes we will might maybe make payments to an independent contractor, payments to a vendor, anybody that's not really a full-time employee. So in all these cases, we would fill out the 1099 form. And again, they have to be completed and postmarked by January 31st. So again, very busy time for a payroll professional. And once these are completed, a copy goes to the IRS and another copy goes to the individual person or perhaps the business that that person works for.